Hi, welcome to a gameplay of Warhammer Fantasy Battle 3rd Edition, which is highlighted here as the one on the left. I'm going to try to compare some versions and tell you what's different about this. One of the things that 3rd Edition came out, there weren't army building tools such as Army Builder to build your army list. I use Army Builder 2. It's an older version of it. I think it's still available. And I'm going to put a link to a Dropbox where you can get my files. My files are glitchy. they still got a lot of bugs that i got to work out. But for the most part, I'm, I'm able to build the armies, select magic weapons, select items for magic weapons. And one of the things that I wanted to do is in 3rd edition, you would uh, buy a troop and then you'd, say, for example, upgrade it with a two-handed weapon. Well, then you had to get the main rule book out and look up two-handed weapon to see what the abilities were that went, went with that. It was very easy to forget these things, so you had to make a lot of notes. The Army Builder file does that automatically. If you take a certain weapon, it will adjust your initiative. For example, two-handed weapon, you reduce your initiative and gives you a bonus to strength. Um, it, it automatically calculates that. Armor reduces your movement. It will calculate that for you. And it has um, the various types of heroes you can take. There's, I, I'm not a professional Army Builder file builder for sure. So I chose to make a lot of drop-down menus um, you, to select different things, like you can select chaotic host and select the the, the type of troop you're going to use. Um, and it has the magic weapons have the ability to take the number of uh, traits based on the level of the character. So this helps a lot, and it'll speed the game up a lot because it's going to give you reference notes and things like that. A couple important things about building armies in third edition: you can take an allied contingent or a mercenary contingent. Allies have a reduced um, leadership. Mercenaries have an increased leadership, but a chance to just walk off the battle and leave you. When they first get into contact, you have to see if they want to fight or not. Um, cause the, and the dice off. Both sides roll dice. And you can take bribery points to bribe your mercenaries with extra money in addition to the points you pay for them, or to bribe the other guy's mercenaries to leave. So that's just something to... to keep in effect but as you can see this is just me scrolling around army builder showing all the different things that are built into it and, and it does it does help over here you can see the baggage train and the uh, bribery points that you're you can take as part of your force selection so building your troops and you can save them and things like that and then it validates everything with your percentages your mins and maxes and things so that's a useful tool that wasn't around back in 1988 when third edition got to play Today it snowed, it was an icy freezing rain day, so I set uh, up my temporary war game table in the rec room, which is why I had to film this video with a uh, tablet, because it's too far away from my computer. I tore down my permanent game table and I built my slot card track. This is a portable setup with a couple of folding tables from Lowe's, and this is a 5x9 mat made out of uh, um, indoor-outdoor carpeting. It's it's a nice setup. I clamp them together underneath to keep them nice and level, and you got three foot down at the end. So you got a, a five foot by twelve foot surface, place for drinks, papers, rules, and here's the uh, layout. A little bit of terrain. We got some a field, a fencing area, a couple of woods, and a, and a hill. Pretty pretty generic. This is the two armies. This is going to be a chaos army with plenty of thugs. Um, chaos. For knights and things like that in 3rd edition, the points were astronomical. Just Chaos Warriors, you couldn't possibly build a 20-man unit of them in a, in a battle. Uh, their points were, I think, you know, really out of control, but they gave you some cheaper troops. Now, Chaos Thugs are good troops. They have a high initiative and a high weapon skill. So they're going to go first. In 3rd edition, you go by initiative order, not, um, not by who charges first. That was introduced later. And that made charging very important. In 3rd edition, charging is important because chargers get plus one to their dice roll. But you go in initiative order, so it's not the end of the world if you get charged. You also deploy by speed, alternating. So the first thing to go now were these Chaos Dwarf weapon teams, because they only have a movement of three. And then it alternates back and forth. You're going to be deploying by slowest troops, so the cast slow ones go down, the orc slow ones go down, which is their uh, artillery pieces. This is interesting because the slower troops are, are penalized because they have to deploy first, 
they don't really get a chance to react to the other deployments. And it also gives a bonus to extremely fast troops because they're going down very last. The fastest thing is the Goblin Wolf Riders. And so the, the Chaos troops had to deploy knowing that the last thing to go down would be Wolf Riders. And there's 30, there's, uh, yeah, there's 30 of them. So there, there could be a big flanking maneuver. So they, they kind of bunched up, give themselves a second line to, to fend off uh, flankers. Orcs and goblins, lots of goblins here. They have low leadership, so they have to stay clustered around the general for two reasons. First of all, animosity. They'll fight each other, and they'll run off at the slightest disturbance. If uh, So, yeah, the, the general with his army banner is right there, and then he's got his guys clustered around him. It, it, it's really hard to run an orc and goblin army because of the fact that they fight each other and they run away. So you, you kind of have to keep that in mind. Your commander has a 12-inch range, and you can take a sub-commander, which has a 2d6 range at the beginning of the game. You roll that. So each side has a sub-commander. The uh, orcs and goblins took their wizard as the second-in-command. And the chaos troops have actually two. They have an allied contingent, but he can only influence troops within his contingent. That's the chaos sorcerer. And then they took a minotaur hero, but the minotaur hero rolled snake eyes. His range is, is non-existent. So that... It's going to give them problems in that they don't have um, the ability to influence leadership really is, is focused on just one guy. So on top of the hill we have some thugs with bows, some thugs with shields and hand weapons, chaos uh, dragon ogres in the back. That's a monstrous host that was summoned and a, a couple more units of thugs. And then you got some chaos trolls over there, heads hanging out, uh, pimples and all kind of stuff going on. Some Marauder Cavalry in the back, really hard as Nails troops. Two wounds each for uh, some of the Chaos units, uh, like such as Knights and Marauders and stuff like that, which makes them tougher than, than you think they are. That unit has a good armor save. So that's, that's their battle line on that side. They're going to try to take the hill and, and form up and see which way the Goblins are going to come from. Once that's determined, then they can react. They have a unit of Thug Cavalry in the back. They're only on horses, not war horses, so the horses do not get an attack. But they're fast, they have a high initiative and a much higher weapon skill than the goblins. So here's the uh, big threat, goblin wolf riders coming on the side with the command. And there is a goblin hero champion there. Most of these units don't have champions. I think the uh, trolls have a minotaur sub-commander leading them and then that one goblin, you know, wolf riders. Then we got some skirmishers down here. You can skirmish certain troops and wolf riders with bows get the skirmisher option. So they're going to be able to pass through terrain quickly and just move around almost as individual models without having to worry about left face, right face. we got our Chaos Sorcerer there and some of the boys he brought along to the fight. He brought the, um, he brought the fireworks with the bazooka teams and mortars. So this is the Chaos first turn movement phase. They're going to move forward, uh, storm up the hill, and the Dragon Ogres are going to come in to try to fill the gap behind the archers. Those archers... Their job is to move forward and draw out any fanatics. Uh, and that's, you, you have to kind of have a sacrificial unit. They're the cheapest unit that the Chaos has. You definitely don't want to draw out fanatics with this unit of Marauder Knights. You want to draw them out with something that's cheap. And yeah, here you can see that the uh, Chaos General is in with his Marauders. And his leadership is on the left side which is important because of the trolls, but it also would have been nice to have some leadership bonus on this side. These guys are going to be on their own, which hopefully that, that won't come back to haunt them. And you can see that the allies do have a, a leadership penalty, so the Chaos Dwarves are leadership one less. This unit did a right face and moved forward. Uh, it's a simple maneuver. You get one simple maneuver free as part of your movement or reserve movement. After that, you have to dice for it. This is the Chaos Mortars. When they fire, they get a heat point. If you keep firing, you're going to keep generating heat points, and eventually they're going to explode. So you have to kind of pause them to um, let them cool back down. I liked Artillery in 3rd Edition. It was pretty straightforward. You rolled a 20-sided dice, and that... Uh, indicated 1 through 12 indicated the direction that it deviated 
and then 13 and up, it hit on target. Some weapons, such as the mortars, malfunction on a 20. The bazooka teams malfunction on an 1819 19, or 20. And the mortars pounded the um, goblin archers with one hit, the other one deviated, and the bazooka scored two direct hits on this unit of goblin spearmen and blew them to pieces. But they have their uh, general right behind there, so they passed their um, panic test from taking 25%. The unit of Goblin Archers was 40 strong, so they only took 8 losses and did not hit the 25% threshold, so they didn't have to test to run away. Leadership is interesting. You get a bonus to your leadership. You don't actually use the General's leadership. You use his bonus. So Goblins only start with a 5, and the leader's bonus is plus 3. So the maximum leadership they get is an 8, whereas the Orcs start at a 7, plus 3 takes them up to 10. So you don't just use the General's leadership. You use his bonus added to whatever the base leadership is of the unit. Here the trolls moved ahead, and this turned out to be a bit of a mistake because um, this is the reserve move. And, you know, a reserve move is just like a standard move. The, the, this game turn phase is broken up. You move, then you do your fighting and shooting, and then you move again, then you cast spells. I think it's pretty interesting. These guys expanded, a simple maneuver, and moved in the reserve phase. Um, it's you don't get a reserve phase if you're within four inches of the enemy or other certain special circumstances, but for the most part, uh, it's different than um, what they is, is out commonly nowadays. They just have a march phase. They condense the reserve and the regular movement into one phase. I don't particularly think it, it slows things down that much, but it definitely is a, is a way of speeding things up to condense them. So here they go. The, the Minotaur hero is with the trolls, but they are out of range of the general. And it turned out that that was a, a, a mistake because the um, Minotaur hero was his, his he was not able to pass the uh, stupidity test next turn. So we'll see what happens with that. And in the magic phase, the Chaos Sorcerer is not going to do anything. So he's going to gain one mana point back. Third edition magic. I really liked it. You just get a pool of mana to spend. You, you roll for your uh, spells randomly. A lot of them are useless. You have to be kind of inventive to try to figure out how to in, in, employ them. He used 20 points of his pool of 30 to summon the Chaos uh, Dragon Ogres. So he's going to rest and get one of those back. So at the beginning of the turn, the Orcs and Goblins have to roll for Animosity. Animosity in 3rd edition was much more uh, interactive than the later editions. You had penalties for different types of goblinoids versus each other, and then the positioning. If someone was directly in front of you, you were more inclined to attack them. But you, you could use your leadership bonus to modify that, and that helped out a lot. So all the units that are within range of the general or the subgeneral, and because they're positioned so that they're, they're clustered together like this. Animosity could be kept in check. Where it became a problem is the small units without leaders out on the flanks like the bolt throwers. These two passed their check, but they could have shot at their own unit off to the side. Unfortunately, this guy failed. He was too far away. He's out in the middle of nowhere. There's no action. And he just takes a shot at the skirmishers. Luckily, he missed. But um, that's what happens with animosity. You kind of really have to keep these guys in line or, or they will just tear each other apart. So the skirmishers move ahead. They don't get penalized for difficult terrain, so they pass through the, the, the hay field there. And, and that's going to be a, a flanking maneuver that has to be watched. There's some chaos marauders in the back that can counter that. These guys are going to stay put and shoot. they got a lot of missile fire, and they don't want to take a minus one penalty, and they also don't want to make it easier for the Chaos guys who want to get into combat. These goblins move ahead. they got their fanatics in there, getting ready to unleash them. Uh, that unit is battered. Two bazooka shots just blew it to pieces. So the shooting phase went pretty well. They concentrated on those trolls and took one down. Um, so and, and they wounded I think they got another wound on them, too. But those... those pretty impressive uh, considering that trolls regenerate. The stone throwers can use speculative fire and they didn't hit anything because they can fire without a line of sight. 
they just randomly blind fire in the general direction of the enemy. It's not as accurate. Uh, these bolt throwers didn't do anything missed. So the reserve phase, the wolf riders were able to take the position inside that stone wall. Um, once again, you can see you, you move, then you conduct your combats and shooting, then you do the reserve phase. After the reserve phase comes magic. And the reserve phase, those wolf riders uh, advanced also. They're threatening the guys on the hill. So we'll see how this goes. And in the magic phase, the little goblin wizard put his enthuse spell on one of those units. He's boosting the leadership of the units to seven or two by plus one. So here we go. The uh, chaos guys move forward, and the archers drew out the fanatics. They shoved the fanatics up the hill and in that direction. One guy almost made contact, but he did not. But it does definitely slow up the advance because you cannot move through fanatics in third edition. They have to be killed by missile fire or by killing themselves. Um, so this broke up their advance. You can see that the thugs are no longer online. Those are the two units of thugs, both with four inches of movement. And the one guy had to stop, the other guy advanced. The trolls went stupid, so they're stuck behind there so that, that the advance was broken up. These Marauder Knights attempted to sort of line up on the wolf riders for for future reference they don't want to charge over the wall that was kind of a mistake because the wolf riders are just too fast they're going to elude them and the dragon ogres move forward over here these guys are going to keep coming around the corner they have a seven inch movement like i said their thug cavalry actually the wolf riders are going to give them up a, a rough fight I think because they have so many more ranks and they have wolves that can attack whereas the thugs only have the riders but they have that's going to be a, a toss up I think so we'll see how they can counter that one of the things is the thugs on the hill exposing their flank is kind of inviting the wolf riders to attack and then in turn be it hit themselves by the cavalry coming around the corner We'll revisit this uh, later, but in 3rd edition you can conduct charges after doing a maneuver. So that's, that's, uh, that's it has to be worked out. So this is where we're at at the end of the reserve phase. For chaos. The Chaos Sorcerer used Leg Breaker to snap the leg of the one fanatic and got rid of him. The other fanatics at the beginning of the phase, two of them killed themselves, and then the other one came back through the Goblin Spearmen and splattered a lot of them. The Goblin Wolf Rider Skirmishers did charge the Mortar Team. They were hated foe, so they pretty much had to unless they passed the leadership test, and they wanted to do it, so they went in. Here's this situation. These Goblin Wolf Riders are going to take the bait and hit that unit in the flank. It's it's an interesting gambit because that unit has to be reduced before it can break. Um, and they will expose themselves to getting hit by the thugs. So we'll see if they can, they can pull this off. What they are going to do is move forward, do a right face, which will put them four wide and five deep and then charge. This is the 22 and a half degree angle. You take a paper corner and you fold it once to make 45 and once again to make 22 and a half. They need to be lined up like that or else they'll be unformed when they charge. Um, so this is this is how they're going to do this. I'm, I'm going to show you how a complex move in third edition works. They move forward a few inches. They're outside of four inches of the enemy so they're allowed to conduct maneuvers during a charge. Once you get within four inches all you can do is do that wheel of 22 and a half degrees or else you're unformed. You can still charge, you're just unformed. So you can do anything you want to within four inches if you're willing to be unformed. The problem is being unformed means you lose all charge bonuses. You don't get the plus for um, charging on your dice roll. And if you get pushed back, you auto break. Being unformed in third edition is, is, is very bad and it's one of the main tactics is to try to get your enemy unformed 
and then hit them and push them back and auto break them because it's very hard to break units in third edition because of the fact that they don't break until they've lost 25%. The unformed units will auto break. So in this case, they're going to meet, come forward, do a right face, and then complete their charge, hit them in the flank. They they win the combat. The dice rolls are just terrible for the, the Chaos Thugs. And they, they, they just got pushed back so they get back two inches. But no break tests because they're still... There's 24 guys to start the uh, round. They need to lose six before they even have to take a break test. But they do get pushed back. And now the Chaos Studies have to come to their rescue. On the cavalry there has to come to their rescue. So so this is the uh, end of combat here for the uh, Orcs and Goblins. You can see the lines are shaping up. Chaos is kind of bowed in the middle. The fanatics kind of held things up a little bit, and then the stupidity that really broke their battle line up. Not good. And the wolf riders over there are wrapping around. They won the combat by virtue of their charge, and they they wrapped around. So they're going to eventually engulf those chaos dwarves. But that's a that's a tough scrap over there. The chaos dwarves have a better weapon skill and a good save with their heavy armor. So yeah, let's see what happens next in the Chaos turn. The uh, Mortar took a shot and strayed off and, and killed some of Rugled's boys there, knocked a chunk of them out. And you can see that um, some of the thugs back here are getting hit with some random speculative fire. Those uh, goblin archers advanced forward to give the trolls behind them a little bit of room to maneuver. They're going to attempt to slip out and engage the uh, Chaos Marauder Cavalry. Trolls have special attacks that are pretty good against heavily armored troops. They have a vomit attack which ignores armor. They have a thump attack. So that's a good matchup of getting those trolls into that unit of Marauder Cavalry. It's one of the few units that can actually really pulverize them. So here we go. Uh, the Chaos. This is their setup. And they got to decide at this point how they can uh, sort this out. This log jam on top of the hill is going to have to be broken up. So they're going to have to come down the hill and fight to get those archers out of the way. This unit, with its 7-inch movement, is not going to be able to make that. I think if they charged, they would be unformed. There would be a chance that they would get pushed back and auto route. And the unit on top of the hill so has plenty of guys, so they're going to hold for a while. All right, these guys charged. The trolls just barely made it. But the goblins failed their fear test and ran away. They actually took their field test further than eight inches so not even the fanatics came out and they ran away so that unit is unformed because it failed to meet a charge if they get pushed back they're auto breaking the other one the thugs right there have two weapons two of them got shot on the way in but they hit harboths pretty hard there and over here the uh, other thugs with bows came down to fight the goblins it's not a good matchup because they don't have any ranks or standards but they need to get out of the way the uh, the Zuka team has no targets, so they're going to march up the hill to give themselves uh, a lot of visibility over the entire battlefield so they can launch some uh, bazooka shots. And these guys moved up in the movement phase. They're going to get even closer in the reserve phase, and they will be able to do attack. And those thugs on the hill just have to hold out. They've only lost two guys. Um, so, yeah, they should be able to hold out for a while because they have a better initiative, much better weapon skill. This would have been a good spot for those guys to form square because they couldn't be pushed back if they had formed square. But uh, hindsight's 2020. Over here, the the thugs beat up on the uh, Harboss archers, pushed them back. Once again, the break test was modified by the general, so they held their ground. Over here, this combat is is actually going pretty bad for these thugs. Their dice rolls are terrible, and the goblins are just making save after save. And they don't even have very good saves, but they're just making them. So 
the dice are not being good to these guys. They have a, a they're getting whittled down, and eventually they're going to have to take a break test if they keep losing. They can hold out for one more round. The cavalry will come to their rescue and just absolutely crush those uh, goblins. Over here, these goblins push the archers back, and this is one of those interesting areas where the if a unit gets pushed back and it can't doesn't have room to make way, what happens to it? There is an example in a book where they said you know, just assume that the unit moves back. I don't agree with that. If you get pushed back and there are enemy in the way, I always play it, you auto-break, just like you auto-break when you get pushed back in your own form. In this circumstance, if these guys got pushed back and they couldn't move because there was a friendly unit in the way, the unit on top of the hill, I would assume, would just kind of bend out of the way a little bit and become unformed in some way. I think that would be a good uh, way of resolving that. They just become unformed because they can't stay in formation at that. So here's the example of the uh, thugs smashing into Harboss archers, pushing them back. They're going to, um, they're, that's bad. If they break, that's going to cause a chain reaction. Uh, but the commander is, is still holding pretty good uh, with his leadership ability. And the army standard lets you re-roll those tests within 12 inches. So it's really important to keep your general and army standard in the thick of the battle, but you can't be everywhere at once. And back here in the corner, the uh, Chaos Dwarves actually failed some saves, and the uh, Wolf Riders keep making theirs. Just, they need a six, they keep making it. So one of the teams is now dead. The other one has been surrounded because the Wolf Riders continue to wrap around. Over here, those guys are informed. The Chaos uh, Marauders move forward. And this situation changed dramatically because the Chaos Sorcerer cast uh, calls panic on the Goblin fighting the uh, bowmen there. They had to take a magical save, which they failed. And the reason they failed it is because they had advanced out of range of their uh, general. So they just had standard goblin uh, stats, not good. And then they had to take a break test, and they failed that as well. So they panicked, and they were in hand-to-hand -hand combat when they panicked, um, or they routed. And so that's going to cause a panic test, everything within 12 uh, that's that's a pretty bad situation. The Wolf Riders miraculously passed because that they had a, a champion in there that boosted them a little bit and saved them, um, but they could have broken and ran. But even though they they held, they're in trouble because the thugs are coming up. Uh, the one Boltsrow crew took off running, and these goblins they you don't use randomized movement in third edition, so they have a three and a half inch movement because they're wearing armor and shield. The thugs have a four inch movement so the goblins can never get away the thugs are going to just keep chasing after them keep hounding them and getting free hacks and killing them off so here we go they do um, they do their their route move and the guys are right on them getting the free hacks and, and killing them uh, they in this situation in third edition in order to, to get these guys saved someone has to come in and help them that tiny little spear unit that's only got a few guys left they might go over and help them or something um, so over here, the uh, routing bowmen of goblins over there calls a panic test on these trolls, which they passed, and they passed their stupidity test because the uh, sub commander's standing right there, so they're going to charge. The other fanatic also died, so the goblin fanatics only managed to kill goblins, and then one of them got his leg broken, the other one all died from his own stupid chain. They didn't pay for themselves, but they, they did break up the advance, which was good. So here the trolls charge the trolls, and that's going to be ugly. Uh, it, it's interesting that trolls have a couple special attacks. Once per game, they can do a, a an attack where they spit acidic vomit, and acid is makes it harder to regenerate. So both sides are going to do that in that combat. I, I just can't imagine what a messy... Horrible pl place that is to be for that Minotaur. All these trolls spewing their bile at each other. Um, these guys advance a little bit, and we're going to try to break up this log jam. Uh, Rugglud's armored orcs in the back make a left face, move forward, and then make a right face by passing a test. Second maneuver, remember, you got to take a test. A musician helps you with that test. And on the hill, the dice for the Chaos guys are terrible. They, the, the cavalry is right there, ready to ride to their rescue, and they just, 
they drop below 25%, and that is their break test. And the Chaos General is all the way on the other side. They don't get a reroll. They don't get nothing. They are going to break. That causes panics in a lot of areas. So the bowmen down below that are busy chasing the goblins, they break, and they're going to run away. So that's two unit of thugs gone. In the ensuing free hacks and pursuit between the wolves and the goblins automatically hitting, free hacks auto hit, you just rolled a wound. You don't get to use your shield when you're running away for a save. That unit was butchered. Um, so that one unit of thugs is eliminated. This unit of thugs down the hill is now breaking. So you have goblins running in that direction and thugs running away from them. That's... Um, really bad they the that unit of thugs on the hill just rolled consistently bad over and over again and the goblins rolled well made some saves so here's the thug cavalry that was coming to their rescue and it is now too late the thug cavalry did pass their test so they don't break and run from that uh the bazooka team passed their test the dragon ogres passed their test so it could have been worse but that's two units gone here's where it got really really bad Harbaugh's orc archers fought back with a vengeance. They just rolled outstanding, and these thugs have two weapons, one left-handed, one right-handed. The rules give you a penalty for fighting with two weapons. You double the number of attacks, but you get minuses for it. So even though they followed up, these thugs rolled terrible. Harbaugh's rolled great, so that they pushed, the momentum got switched, and now these guys got pushed back. And because of the shooting that had whittled their numbers down, they had to take a break test, and there it is, they failed it. Over here, the trolls were battered down to just one guy, and so you get a free hack when the guy breaks. You get a free hack during the pursuit. So during the pursuit, it finished off the last of the trolls. One of the orc and goblin trolls died in the combat. Um, these trolls have a 12-inch pursuit. They're going to pursue right into that unit of Marauder Knights. And that's going to just be a very bad situation for the Chaos General because these guys, they've already used their special vomit attack, but they're going to have their thump with club and they're going to pulverize those guys. Because those knights have two wounds, remember, but the thump with club does D3 wounds per hit. And I think it's no armor save where it has a major minus to the armor save. The notes are on the army builder files. Luckily, I don't got to go to the book. And worst case, worst, worst, worst. The last unit of Chaos Thugs that's right here in the center of everything, the guys with fur, they fail their panic tests and they break. So all four units of Chaos Thugs are now running. Uh, or dead. That's bad. Um, there is some Thug Cavalry that's still alive, but they're not, they're not fabulous troops. So here it is after they do their panic run move. They're running past the general, he, or the wizard. He's going to take a panic test at the start of the turn because he's within four inches of a fleeing unit. Um, that's as bad as it gets. The free hacks from Harboths. Now, these thugs are faster than Harboths archers, so they do get away. But they get a couple of free hacks in as they as they chase them, and that unit is heavily reduced. Um, guys with toughness three and no armor, and you automatically hit them. That's a, that's a lot of casualties. It's interesting in 3rd edition, the, the importance of speed, even the slight variations of speed between different armor types when it comes to de the deployment, pursuing, charging, and um, fleeing. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, there's a real trade-off to stacking up with armor and then having the, the fact that you can never run away. Or you can never catch someone who's lighter than you. And you can actually withdraw from combat in 3rd edition if you're faster than your opponent. So if the fight's not going your way, you can do a fighting withdrawal and just drop back. Um, over here, these Goblin Wolf Riders, again, outstanding die rolls on their part. They killed the other two uh, Chaos Dwarves, and now they are formed up and ready to go. That troll setting there is just a casualty I didn't remove yet. So this is the problem. The, the, uh, the Wolf Riders are perfect at chasing down fleeing troops because the fleeing troops can never escape from them. And right in front of them are some fleeing troops. Uh, they're going to just slaughter these guys. And they're going to run free throughout the back of the Chaos Army. At this point, I think it's just the game has been decided. I mean, I know the Dragon Ogres haven't been committed, but being a summoned host, they're only going to fight one round, two possibly. Um, and with a summoned host, they fight one round of combat, then you roll a D6. On a 4, 5, or 6, they'll fight a second round. That's it. And then you have some Thug Cavalry on the side. 
So this is my observations about third edition. Uh, overall, I, I like the magic system better. I like the, you just have a pool of mana, you spend it like money. You don't waste a lot of time. Uh, with later editions, the magic phase became a game within a game. You had to just pause everything, roll for your power dice, roll for your channeling. You sit there and screw around with each other, countering each other's spells. In this game, you really can't counter any spells. You know, so you know what you're getting. There's a couple spells that are ridiculously powerful, like Vorp or Hurricane of Chaos, but just don't use them. Um, there are... I like the artillery rules better. Uh, the D20 works. I don't know why they eliminated that. Maybe because Games Workshop doesn't make D20 dice. Who knows? Um, there are some rules that... Uh, the cannon rules I don't think work, so don't use cannons uh, unless you can fix them. I love chariots and I have lots of chariot models. Chariot rules don't work in 3rd edition. They're just not... Um, they're not very practical. But I like the way that troops stay around and fight until they've taken some losses. And I like the way that you take your leadership test unmodified. I know that a lot of people say that it really uh, advantages units like dwarves. You know, a block of dwarves in third edition with their leadership is not going to get pushed around. And they stay and fight. I actually like that. Their troops are more reliable and dependable. You can kind of count on them things. On top of this hill, I mean, they, they, those Chaos Thugs invited the attack because they knew they were going to stay for a while. And even though they rolled horrible, they still stayed through three combats. So, a couple of tips about 3rd edition if you decide to get into it. It's just two books, Army Book and Battle Book, so you're not spending a fortune. It's stagnant. You don't have to worry about new units coming out with new abilities. And that's a big plus. I like the cartoonish nature, the, the humor that was back in this version. I, I prefer that, um, which is probably why I like the Heroes system for 40k. Um, so the third edition was breakable, you know, and for many years I would get angry because game designers didn't make their game unbreakable. And I reached the conclusion a while recently that it's not the designer's fault. If a game player takes a sledgehammer and beats it up, you can't expect any system to stand up to it, especially when it's just complex. There are a couple of rules in here that just don't work. Like I said the chariots, cannons are two that come to mind right away. I think flying rules are overly complicated in third edition. The ability to stack um, characteristics in a weapon, depending on the level of the character. A level 25 character can take a sword with five abilities. There is an FAQ that was published in White Dwarf that says you can only use one ability per turn. But that can really create a very, very powerful weapon. I do like the fact that all the magic items, all the magic standards are, are uh, universal so that everybody's drawing from the same pool. I love the fact that the magic spells are, are so random and wacky uh, that you're just rolling and you can just get something like leg breaking. Um, you know, and the, the wizard found a way of using it. So that's some of the great things about 3rd edition. But it it was possible to exploit these rules and create unplayable games, which is why we stopped playing. I'm going to give you an example of the most extreme uh, case that I remember from 3rd edition. White Dwarf published the Norse Armulus, giving the Norse player the ability to take a level 4 ring. Now, the problem is level 4 spells are very powerful, and you can choose the spell. You don't have to randomly roll it. There's a 4th level necromantic spell that costs 35 points to cast. So in order to even cast it, you've got to take a top-level Necromancer and use all of his mana at one shot. Does a strength 3 hit with no armor save to every living thing on the table. So what this guy did, he always insisted on using the advanced deployment rules, which allowed you to keep troops in reserve off the table. One guy would walk onto the table on his side, hidden in the woods. The guy would use his ring to cast Wind of Death. Everything on the table that was living took a strength 3 hit, and then resulting panic tests and things of that nature with no armor save. Next turn, no one showed up, just that same guy hiding in the woods. He cast Wind of Death again. When you use a magic ring on a six, it's exhausted. If you don't roll six, it's still usable. After about three turns of this, the entire other army had been eliminated by being slaughtered or running away. And then his army could show up. He never had to get his army out of the case. So this is an example of someone who found some rules which I think was a typo in White Dwarf, to be honest with you. Found some rules, found a way of quickly and efficiently winning a game with virtually no 0% chance of ever losing. The games were terrible, in my opinion. They were just not enjoyable at all to play in that way. But this is an example of how you can break a system. Perfectly legal, within the rules, and guess what? It was 
it created terrible games. But as you can see from this gameplay, you can also create a couple of armies, go out there and have some fun, watch a narrative game being played, and see the battle being decided by a desperate uh, battle on a hilltop and units breaking, and that's, that's how it should be. All right, thanks for watching.